Alright. <coughs> so in metals, we've got four main types. We have sand casting, which is all one type of sand casting, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of sand do they use on that one? The zircon, silicone, or silica, silica mix, right? And then they used a glue to hold it together, right? And they they, they did the glue with, um, they used some, like, a gas to activate the, the glue, right? So that gas was CO2, carbon dioxide. And back on the back, I've got the little medallion thing. CO2 on it, and it gets real hard, so you can cast into it. What other types of sands are used for casting? Yeah. When I did uh, casting, uh, we didn't add CO2 to the sand that we had. Yeah, there's some sands you don't have to. But that, that's, that's, that sand was white, right? Mm -hmm. They also have sand that's kind of blackish in color. Was that the kind you used? Yeah. Do you know what, what that was called? Anybody? You're reading the book, right? We're reading online about what we're talking about. <clears throat> it's oil sand. So it has oil in the sand. And so that just, you, you put it together and you press really hard to get it to lock together. <clears throat> and that's what a lot of casting is. One of the benefits of the zir zircon sand uh, it would be in, with the glue is that the sand particles are smaller, so you get a better finish on it. Um, and then what were the the cores? What did, what did the cores do? Why 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 put the cores inside of it? What did the core do? No. They they coated the cores with talcum powder so that it wouldn't bond to it. But what was the core itself for? Could you do it without a core? It depends, right? If I was casting this, I'm casting that C, the C part of the C clamp. Would I need a core for that? No, you just need a bottom of the mold and top of the mold, right? <clears throat> if I wanted to, to mold the hole into it here also, then I would need a core right there for that, for the hole. Yeah, so cores are used to have a hollow spot in the middle of your, of your casting. So anytime you want something hollow inside, you have to use a core so the mold, the metal doesn't go into that spot. sand cores, but you can also use metal cores. And you saw on the engine block, they actually put metal inserts into it also. So now we had two different types of metal come out. So, <clears throat> what's a really good use of, and so sand castings, do we get exact tolerances? No. Do you do sand casting? No. What about the surface? Is the surface nice and smooth? No. 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 So, but what is it really good at? Making multiple things. Yeah, make, you make a lot of things, but even that, even more than that, what's it good at? It's cheap, it's fast, 
and you get a rough shape that's pretty close. So remember back last week, one of the things was uh, reduce operations using less material. So if I was going to make the C-clamp out of a, a block of material, I've got a lot of cutting to do, right? I've got a lot of complex cutting here. If I do it as a, out of a mold, I really got to drill a hole there. That's it. Maybe flatten that off if I want. But even if I was making something that was going to be finished on all sides, <clears throat> by casting it first, then I've got a lot less material to take off. So like on the engine block, they didn't care about most of it, but the things they cared about, they machined. Um, so when you look at drawings, you know how we put fillets on everything? A lot of drawings you'll see a lot of fillets on things. That's because sharp corners like that, has to be, that means it's a machine surface. Right? The only way to get sharp corners is to machine it. But then other ones got fillets on it. That's kind of that. That was a rough cast to get that shape. One indicator. Um, and so you can kind of get the rough shape. Things that you need to that need to tire tolerances. You machine things that don't. You just kind of leave. I got an engine. Most of it. It doesn't really matter what the outside spacing on it is. So they just leave it. Things that matter, so where the cylinder heads meet, where mounting plates are, those they machine, because that stuff matters. <clears throat> what about investment casting? That was that propeller. What was the benefit of that over sand casting? What about the sand on it? Where, where, what was it like where the sand met the metal? It was smooth, right? When it came out of the, the, the casting, it had a pretty good finish on it. It was a little bit they had to, they had to buff off, but it was a lot better than the sand casting, right? But what about the shape? Easy to do that same shape with a two-part mold or even with cores. Probably not as easy, right? Because it had the the curves, it had everything. You saw how it was for them to get the to get the wax copy out of the mold that made the wax. They kind of had to move it, and bend stuff a little bit, so that if that was trying to put cores together that don't move, it'd be really hard. So you get a, a better surface finish, you get a lot more intricate shapes, um, and then you can use one kind of master mold to make a lot of, and you can make a lot of them at one time. <clears throat> you can also, there they did each waxing kind of by itself. You can also take each of your investment castings, each of the, the wax covered ceramic, or each of the wax by itself before you cover it, attach it to a main kind of center column, so that then you cover it in your ceramics, so you pour it once you get 50 parts. Then you just have to cut off the middle runner. <coughs> so you can do it with wax. So wax really good melts. You can also do it with that. With the 3D printer, you can do investment casting. You just melt out the plastic. You just have to change what temperatures you use. <coughs> what about die casting? It's die casting. Yeah, now we're using, because these two, we're just kind of pouring it in and letting it sit. <laughs> the die casting, we're, we're pressing it. We're putting it under pressure, so like Hot Wheels, Matchbox cars, those are die cast. They have a, a pattern cut into a metal mold, and then they, they shoot the, the new metal into that same mold. And they just make sure that they can come off. So you get a lot more detail, a lot better finish. Um, okay. Questions on that? So, what's a die? Yeah, it's 
the thing that you're going to make it from. So we we'll use dyes in molding. We also use dyes in all the other types of process we'll talk about. But it's the, the basic shape that you want your finished product to match, or it's going to what's going to shape your finished thing. <laughs> so in die casting, you'd have the two halves of the die. pushed in under pressure <coughs> into, in to make your shape. Okay. Then what's centrifuge casting? What's a centrifuge? It spins, right? <coughs> so if you do centrifuge casting, what do you think that does? Yeah, so you pull the middle material in the middle and it pushes out into a mold around the outside of something. So if you want it to be outside and not a lot of stuff inside, because like if you want to do uh, something around, what? Hollow chocolate bunny. Yeah. That's a little bit differently. That's, we'll talk about that next, on the next slide. Uh, but if you want to do like a steel ring, or actually, these are probably pretty good examples. These are probably dinosaurs. If I did, if I pour the material in here, would it all, would, can we guarantee it got into all the things out here? Or if we pour it here, could we guarantee it got over here evenly? But if we pour it here and spun it, then it would force it out and fill up the outside and fill up all the inside stuff. So that's where centrifuge comes in hand. Spinning. Yeah. So this is spinning, and you fill it up, and, or you can fill it and then spin it real fast, or kind of right after it. But and that'll that'll fill out the material everywhere. Yeah. Any question on those? All right. So plastics. We have injection molding. Real common one we hear about a lot, right? Um, we saw it there, kind of like die casting, or exactly like die casting, just now we're using a plastic instead of, or something else other than metal. <coughs> um, injection molding has a lot of, and same with die casting, but injection molding, we talk about plastics, usually use a lot more than we do die casting. And there's a lot of things to look at when, when you're talking about injection molding. So, kind of here's an example of an inject injection mold, the two halves of the mold, and where you put different things. Because when you have an injection mold in a die, you can't put cores in it, right? Or harder to put cores? Because you're not in there doing it yourself. You saw them put the, that little handle in it, right? Mm -hmm. So that handle is a core. But what if you wanted that to go really fast? And you don't want to have to have a person there going like this. How could you get that hole in it? Or that big a hole would be a real hard thing, so that's why they got a person doing it. But what if you want something else on the side of it? Or you want a hook. So like here, hooks. How do you mold it, injection mold it with those hooks? Because now can that die pull straight out? No. So that's why they have things like this. So they have slides. So the, the mold comes out, the slide goes down, and now your part gets kicked out. And they have injectors built in so that just kind of pushes it out to knock your part out. Then the slide goes back up, other half closes, injects again, slide goes down, pops it out. What do you think the slide is? Or how much does it cost? Does it add a lot to the cost? Yeah, slides add a lot to the cost. So you want it to make it so you can just pull it straight across. So if you have to slide it or do any other things, then it adds to the cost. Why is that because they had to build a part to Now, instead of the mold just being two parts that open and close, now they have to make parts that slide. They have to make things that make it slide. So it just make, adds complexity, adds cost. 
Also, plastic's not as forgiving as metals are. Um, so I've got these, this kind of shows different guidelines for features. So in plastics, you usually want everything to be about the same thickness. Why? Flexibility? Uh, not really. The way that cools? Yeah, the, the way it cools. So, <clears throat> what would be difference if we had this all one thickness and then this big old chunk here? And then cool before the other part. Yeah, this is up at cool before this. And if you look at this, so I want you guys all to come up and look at this later. And look at what happens on the back side where there's that big chunk. It actually indents the plastic. Same thing here with these. These are different percentages of the base thickness. See what it does to the other side. That really affects the appearance of plastic stuff on what you have going on in it. Is that because of the weight of the different It's just because it, it cools at a different rate. It cools faster, there's a lot more mass in there. So it cools faster and pulls in from the thinner stuff. Yeah. Um, it also has some things about side poles or cam poles. Like this one, they could they could pull out, or they'd have to cam it somehow. This one, this hook though, they could do on a straight pull. They don't. Have to. This hook, cheap. This hook, expensive. Exactly the same hook, right? Now between the two hooks, uh, one, has a one has a hole, so the die can just have a stick, a thing that sticks out through there, and up to the bottom of the hook. This one has to be able to move out of there somehow. The same function, just a little change to the design makes the cost a lot different. Um, so come take a look at this. Um, this this one too. This has a lot of advanced features for injection molding. Uh, this one's done by Proto Mold, and this one's done by. Uh, I guess they're both by Proto Mold. So yeah, both of these are by Proto Mold. Um, they have a really good design guide that I'll put on Moodle um, today. So if you're doing injection molding stuff, a lot of good things. This company actually does fast around low volume molds. So, molds, do you think they're cheap or expensive? What? Cheap expensive. Do it all the time. Those, they have some that are cheap, some that are expensive. But if you're doing a high production injection molds, you're looking at at least $10,000 each. <clears throat> and so, we got, and we'll talk more about how the molds are made later. We're going to get to stuff like EDM. Um, but they'll use kind of different processes for making the mold, depending on how many parts you want out of it, and what tolerances. But they'll make molds with just a CNC cutter to make low volume things that you can, you can start getting molds within a week. Um, or they'll do the, the longer process and give you good quality molds to make thousands of parts. Uh, kind of depends on what you want to pay for. And low production, they'll start them at like $2,500 for a mold. <coughs> um, so I'll put the design guide up if you want to look at that a good thing to, to kind of see of what to look at, look for. Also, what else should we be looking at with molds? Not just here, or injection mold, but also die casting. What's another thing? You've got mold going in and out. What's another thing you should probably think about? size of your parts. It's going to change. Yeah. So, but also, if I, you know, if you've got a 
two boxes and they're stacked on top of each other. Can you pull them apart real easy? You know, if they're, yeah, because they're vertical walls, you got a lot of friction there. So you want to add some taper to them. So we, now instead of the walls being straight up and down, make them taper a little bit. So now when you, as soon as you start lifting, now you're not sliding anymore. Now it's completely free and can move. So it adds, it makes opening and closing the mold a lot easier. <clears throat> and you're not dragging that so you don't risk damaging that surface. So depending on how deep the part is, there's guidance for what the taper should be. Also, when you add taper to it, now you can add texture on that side. And so on that one, on the purple one, there's examples of texture. And then on the flat surface, you have texture too. So now that can hide some of the little defects from thicknesses and stuff. All right. Any other questions on injection molding? What materials are usually injection mold? Plastic. Yeah, plastic. So what types of plastics? Yeah. So ABS, right? It's a big one. Nylon. Can you injection mold clear stuff? Polycarbonate? Yeah. yeah. To make the domes for the security cameras, the injection mold it. And they have to be real careful when they're printing it down because it can bend when it's still a little hot. <coughs> um, so, any questions on injection? So, then rotational. This is what Josh was talking about with chocolate bunnies. So, there's some overlap between some of the with plastics and also as to the food because. Food has a lot of kind of the same qualities as plastics. So like rubber, like hollow chocolate bunnies, right? You put a little bit of material in the middle of the mold and then you go like that and it coats all the outside. That's rotational molding. They'll put it, they'll have a mold, they'll fill it, put some material on it, and they'll just turn it around all different ways until it coats the whole outside and it cools. Also the same way they make, um, um, they, they do that for some styrofoam things. Um, um, sometimes, sometimes containers, things like that. Um, what about dip molding? Do you see that? Like it sounds. Okay. You dip the mold in some material and pull it out. picture, think about what it is. So you, you dip the mold in the material, you pull it out, and you cure it. What could that be used for? Like the propeller? No. It was used to kind of coat the propeller, right? Yeah. To, put so to make the investment casting. So yeah, kind of used it in another process. But how could you, what final product could you use, make using dip casting? Oh, you can make like a porcelain, like porcelain dolls and stuff. But we gotta get this mold out of there. Balloon. Oh. Balloon. That's how they make balloons. Because now the balloon they can stretch back over the, the thing. Oh. Hold on. That, that's the main one that I've seen. I was probably sleeping in that one. What? We, we didn't watch it today. Oh. <laughs> what about slush? Think of slushy stuff. Think of cream sickles. Yeah. Cream sickles. You know, it's got vanilla ice cream in the middle and the, the orange ice cream, ice cream thingy shell. I have something for Kaima and uh, uh, the house made on that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they the, it's kind of the opposite. And then they start to freeze it, and then when I start to freeze, they get it back. It's kind of the opposite of the <coughs> of dip molding. Here we have the cavity, you fill it up, kind of like the toilet, right? 
fill it up, let it harden, you pour out the rest. So that's dip molding. <clears throat> In ceramics, they don't call it dip molding. I mean, they don't call it slush molding, even though it's basically the same thing. They call it drain molding. Drain molding. Just like we had die casting, injection molding, now we have slush molding and drain molding. Same basic thing, two different names because it's two different materials. Okay. Any questions? All right. Um, so no questions on that?